hereby I open this academic cer ceremony in which Henricus Johannes Rick van Hoof will defend the academic thesis, the brain as image processor and generator towards function restoring brain computer interfaces. And before we start, I would like to welcome the audience, both here present and online, and uh, of course the family. And um, actually it's quite a special occasion for me as first time uh, pro-rector, because I still remember that uh, together with uh, Professor Peter de Weert, we interviewed you for uh, the uh, Selective Research Master Program and you convinced us to admit you despite your uh, different background and today again proves that you were right. So may I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis? Yeah, dear Prorector, dear highly esteemed opponent, dear family, friends and colleagues, um, I hope that my voice will last because I just recovered from a bad cold. Um, <clears throat> so as neuroscientists are slowly unraveling the mysteries of the brain, uh, more and more people are looking towards technological solutions to deal with loss of brain function caused by brain, uh, brain damage or disease. So I will, I will start with introducing my work uh, by giving a short introduction to the visual system in humans. And then I will give, um, I will, I will uh, talk about some specialized brain regions uh, and uh, how these may, how the locations of these brain regions may vary between individuals. Then I will talk about uh, what kind of causes that can be, to, that can lead to brain damage and loss of brain function and how these can possibly be, be uh, uh, fixed using brain computer interfaces. So next to merely processing visual information, the brain also has this amazing capability of generating mental images. And I will show you how we can find out what's going on in the so-called mind's eye. So all vision starts with light. So as light particles, um, they reflect an object, for example, an apple. These particles, they travel through, the, through your eye to the back of your eye called the retina. And here there are millions of um, photoreceptor cells that uh, transfer this information into neurochemical signals. And these neurochemical signals, they travel all the way to the back of your brain via fiber pathways to a region called the visual cortex. And it's the visual cortex that's central to our work. So interesting feature about uh, in visual perception is that the spatial relationships between objects that you see, they are preserved in the way that the brain is organized. And as the connections from your eyes cross uh, when they go to the back of your brain, um, each half of your uh, brain will respond to visual input from the other half of your visual field. And also, if you have two dots of light uh, that you present to an eye uh, very closely together, also the neurons that respond to these dots of light in the brain will be positioned very closely together. So we try to, to understand this, um, these principles using uh, fMRI. I'm sure you're aware of, um, uh, if you're familiar with MRI, which stands for magnetic resonance imaging, and this allows you to uh, obtain structural images of the brain. And with fMRI, we can also study um, <coughs> the living brain uh, by measuring uh, brain activity. And when we talk about brain activity as measured with fMRI, we talk about a reflection of neurons that are firing in the brain in response to some visual input. And uh, for example, when they fire, they, they consume uh, oil, energy and oxygen, and this needs to be resupplied. And this is resupplied by sending blood to this area. And when this happens, the, there is this change in the uh, so-called um, level of um, <coughs> excuse me, oxygenated hemoglobin. And this change has a magnetic signature that we can capture using fMRI. You can also see the brain as a three-dimensional object. And we obtain 2D images of the brain also across time. So we use this technique to study the brain. And we did an experiment with 20 individuals where we um, ask these participants to look at uh, different types of images, for example, of faces, places, objects, characters, bodies, and even moving dots. And we know that there are brain regions that act that selectively respond to specific types of uh, categories like these. And now we were mainly interested in finding out how well do these locations of these brain regions correspond between individuals. So we acquired brain, uh, structural brain scans, um, so we know the geometry of each person's brain. We put that together and we align them. And so we can also then label uh, the regions that are active um, when, the, when, the, when the person sees a, a specific type of stimuli. 
and we can add these activity maps together to create a so-called probability map. And as long as you have a sufficient number of individuals, a probability map can tell you what the odds are of finding a certain uh, point in the brain that corresponds to a certain region in someone else's brain. So you see an example of the probability map in this uh, picture on the right, for example, for places or for faces. And here is an example of what this would look like if you take all these, um, these regions together in a so-called probabilistic atlas. And importantly, a neuroscientist, neuroscientists can use this atlas to project the location of a specific brain region to a brain of someone else, for example, their own study participants. So we also try to validate these uh, findings using um, measures of overlap, cross-validation, and of course, comparing it to independent data sets. And we find that, these are, that the predictability of these areas uh, may vary between regions, but they, I think they serve as a great alternative um, in the, for the case where researchers don't have the uh, possibility of selecting the, of, um, collecting their own uh, information about these regions. For example, when you have blind individuals. So our brain has this cool ability to um, process visual information, what if you become severely injured? You could think, for example, about people that come to got into an accident um, or suffer from autoimmune disease. So they lose the ability um, to communicate or even move around. And similarly, people that um, became blind in a critical period during which the brain uh, learns to make sense of the visual input that comes in, into the retina, these people find it very difficult uh, to cope with a life in which you cannot see. And so the biggest problem in these people is that the connection between the eyes and the brain is lost. So nowadays we have these brain computer interfaces that allow us to directly interface with the brain and communicate with the device. And this hopefully will allow it eventually um, to be able to, to restore some of these brain functions like uh, people that become blind by restoring some form of vision. And we'll talk about this a bit more. So as I mentioned before, each half of the brain corresponds to the visual field, to the opposite side of the visual field. And the spatial relationships are uh, retained. So this also means that if I were, if I were to uh, electrically stimulate a group of neurons in the visual cortex, then you will perceive a dot of light in a specific region in visual space. And this region we call the receptive field. And a dot of light we, we call we call a phosphine. And it's this principle that you can use to create patterns of phosphine. So the percept of, for example, a letter shape. Here's an example of if you would stimulate the brain, how you would elicit a dot of light. And here's an example of how a system could, could uh, use this, um, uh, this principle uh, to create patterns of, of a percept by stimulating the brain directly. And you can even think about, uh, so, so the uh, devices that you use for this are called visual cortical prostheses. And basically they work like um, a system that connects electrodes to a camera, and then we can approximate the images taken by this, by this camera by uh, selectively um, stimulating um, the, cortical, <coughs> the cortical area. So of course, when you talk about the visual cortical prosthesis, it just means electrodes inside the brain, and this re requires brain surgery. So fortunately, already people have been working on human and monkey studies to, to um, make sure that these things, uh, these, these devices will be safe. <clears throat> However, we still don't know where we want to place these electrodes because there are differences in the way uh, between the anatomy and also the functional organization of individuals. What we can do is we can predict the functional organization if we have the anatomical information of a blind individual, but then we still don't know which parts of the visual space we want to, um, to elicit these phosphines in and how, how we should uh, place these electrodes in order to achieve that. So we create this digital experiment, oh, sorry. Uh, we first want to know where in visual space we want to have these phosphines. So do you want them in the, in the top part of your visual field or maybe in the bottom part of the visual field as you see on the left? Or perhaps it's more useful to have them in the center of the visual field and ni nicely close together. So this really depends on what task you want this virtual this, uh, implant to, um, to achieve. You could think, for example, about navigation or reading. And these things might require a totally different uh, configuration of these phosphines. So therefore we run a digital experiment. So we have this electrode, um, electro grid with, uh, you see yellow dots on, the, on each electrical wire. These are basically electrodes. And 
we can vary the spacing along this wire of these electrodes. And we can also vary the spacing in which the, uh, the depth in which these electrodes may penetrate the brain. And then we also evaluate which possible which angle are possible in a realistic way that we can approach the brain and insert these electrodes. So we did an experiment in a, a large uh, number of uh, samples. So we take the samples from a huge, uh, from a large uh, data set. And in 181 brains, we do this virtual implantation. And then we try to find the best set of parameters for these electrodes and angle and uh, approach, approach angles um, using a machine learning tool called Bayesian optimization. And this can efficiently find these parameters and try to, and we try to match uh, like a ideal set of phosphine configurations compared to um, what we would get with this uh, implant. So overall, our algorithm seems to work really well. Um, here's an example. So if you want to target, for example, the central part of the visual field, uh, this is where the, um, the, our optimization framework tries to place these electrodes, so nicely in the visual cortex. And this is what, what, the, what the possible result could be for an individual. Uh, so it's nicely inside the, um, the region where we want to have it. The distribution is rather patchy and non-uniform. We think this might be due to uh, the shape of the electrode that we use. So perhaps if we can design electrodes that nicely follow the curvature of the brain, you, get, you could get closer to the ideal phosphine distribution. So to summarize, we create this framework that allows us to safely explore and optimize these electrode placements for visual cortical prosthesis. And we can easily extend this, this framework um, with electrode designs that are uh, specifically tailored to uh, patient's uh, anatomy. And we, got, we can also uh, have it include multiple grids of electrodes with the aim of, in the end, um, creating these functions, these prostheses that can help to restore vision. So non completely blind persons, they cannot see anymore, but they can still, re they still report visual experiences. So very vivid, vivid, vivid experiences based on their past visual experience. And we refer to this experience as seeing in the mind's eye or visual mental imagery. And it's believed that the mechanisms in the brain uh, that are responsible for um, processing visual input and for generating these mental images are very closely related. So we did this experiment where we map the spatial organization of the visual cortex by presenting bars of light at different moments in time. And then we can basically, the brain uh, essentially translate these bars of light into electrical um, signals. And this is a process called encoding. And we can uh, capture these uh, signals with fMRI in the form of brain, brain patterns. So because we can approximate this, this mechanism mathematically, we can also invert this process or this model, and we can translate the brain activity back into an image. And this process is called decoding. So as we know which part of the brain responds to, uh, corresponds to which part on the screen, we can also use the same approach to decode letter shapes. And so another cool part of our work is that we can also do this for only imagined letter shapes. And basically use the same technique to translate a brain pattern during mental imagery back into a picture. So using a relatively simple model, we should be only be able to reconstruct these images if activity patterns during mental imagery uh, have the same fine-grained spatial information as during visual perception. And on, on the left, you can see what we can get with uh, perceived letters. On the right, you can also see that we, we are able to retrieve uh, letter shapes that are only imagined. So therefore, we can conclude that the activity patterns during official perception, they, have, they share very similar spatial uh, information as the mental imagery. So on top of that, we've also seen that activity patterns during imagery are less pronounced and a bit more noisy than while perceiving letter shapes. And so we have created, we have used this um, machine learning tool called an autoencoder that can make these reconstructions of let, imagine letter shapes more recognizable. And you can see, for example, on the top row, uh, the image reconstructions. And after we run these uh, images through this auto, uh, through this um, uh, autoencoder network, these images become they, they resemble more the perceptual ones. And these developments make this mind reading paradigm even more interesting for applications like communication restoring brain computer interfaces. So to, to summarize, I showed you that we have, we can find these category selective regions 
that we can reliably predict between individuals. And we provide this probabilistic atlas for the neuroscience community. Then we also show that we can use a, um, a flexible uh, optimization framework to uh, simulate uh, the implantation of electrodes that, are, that, are be, that have to be used for visual cortical prosthesis. And we make this uh, uh, <coughs> available online. And finally, we also show that activity patterns for mental imagery and visual perception are very similar. And therefore, we can use this idea to this principle to uh, reconstruct letter shapes directly from the mind's eye. And together, these new funded these, these set new foundations for neurotechnology and medical applications that could one day help to restore limited communication or motor functioning. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and give the word back to the director. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, the opposition will now be opened by Professor. Uh, Bea de Gelder, chair with a chair in social and effective neuroscience at Maastricht University. Mr. Candidate, let me first of all congratulate you personally and uh, include in my congratulations your promoters and all people that in one way or another, and I suppose there are many ways, have uh, contributed to the achievement of this work. And thank you, of course, also for this very nice and very straightforward presentation. Um, I am very, in, I've been very interested in your work and I was very interested in re, uh, reading some of it I knew before. And of course, uh, as, um, <laughs> as to be, is this to be expected in any kind of scientific discourse, there are always many more questions than answers. I, uh, since I'm the first one to start this little, this, this important, this short but important discussion, my question is fairly general and is of course inevitably, inevitably motivated by some personal uh, issues I uh, dealt with in past and present work myself and to which I think your insight may, insights may contribute. Uh, my question uh, combines uh, your work on the, on the category areas and the atlas with your views on the importance of mental imagery. I very much applaud uh, what you say, both in the thesis and in your in, in your propositions, on the importance of mental imagery. I think it's uh, embarrassing neglect in our field uh, that we never uh, realize fully realize the importance of mental imagery when we when we give task instructions to people, and when you get when you in this, even in the simplest experiment, you ask a forced choice: is it a, is it a camel or a donkey? Uh, we never take into account that we trigger a whole pre process of mental imagery that importantly contributes to, uh, to the responses uh, people give. Uh, good. Uh, having said all that, I'm a little bit uh, intrigued by uh, your very straightforward um, assimilation of perception of brain structures involved in perception and brain structures involved in mental imagery. And to be very, very, um, and of course, I agree with you that better understanding of mental imagery opens incredibly important avenues for uh, remediation, rehabilitation, uh, compensation of blind, uh, of congenitally blind people, etc. However, uh, you may be your going a little bit too fast and it's going to take a little bit more conceptual as well as empirical effort. Uh, I'm going just to give you the case of one specific patient with brain damage. Um, this is a patient with um, first severely impaired behavior in recognizing faces. I mean if immediate immediate friends families no absolutely no 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 behavior is zero. Okay. Now the, the MRI shows that uh, uh, shows a structurally intact face area. Okay. The functional MRI shows a functional that face area is functional. You get face activity in the category specific area. Okay. But um, and mental imagery of this patient is intact. I ask him, is the face, what is the, what is the, the distance between the eyes of this person and that kind of thing? However, <laughs> so mental imagery is intact, perception is intact, but behavior is completely failing. So is that not an argument in favor uh, against a very, uh, against a very, very uh, uh, straightforward assimilation of same, same uh, uh, brain uh, activity involved in perception and, uh, and uh, mental imagery? Of course, I mean, this is global issue, just maybe some comment on that. Uh, Highly, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments and for your question. 
so your question um, refers to a, a case study where a patient is able to uh, not not able to um, recognize faces, but the brain is still intact, um, as is ev evidenced by um, structural and functional MRIs. And or I, can, I should actually I can simplify it. Does uh, does mental imagery follow uh, follow perception? Does perception follow mental imagery? And uh, if not, as my case illustrates, um, what, is it enough to focus on the category specific areas? Should we not function? Should we not also focus on the connections between them? Yes. And if so, uh, how would your atlas look if you had to take it bring into bring into the picture? Uh, some issues about connectivity of those areas. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And of course, um, taking only uh, selective regions that are involved in a huge network, a dynamic network that is involved with, for example, uh, face recognition, uh, this is only part of the story. So I also believe that uh, it's, it's mainly the connections that are, that are very important uh, in these processes. And it might be um, that, for example, uh, the connections running from this face area to uh, regions that are involved in um, consciousness. So maybe this person um, is simply not aware uh, of, of um, um, so basically the brain is might be able to recognize a face, but uh, this person cannot consciously re report about it. So that might be a difference, or there might be some something that is disrupted in the connections between regions that are invo involved in consciousness. And otherwise, um, I think in general, it's, it's, it's definitely um, still very relevant to have these uh, cortical atlases that, in which you can um, basically select a region that we know that is responsible um, or, or at least involved in the face processing. But I think there are, there's also this, um, there are also examples that in which, um, so, so I think that's not up to debate. So that re these regions are are definitely uh, part of the processing, processing pathway for recognizing faces. I think that that's, that's enough evidence for that. And I think this is a very interesting case that you mentioned. And I think it definitely might be something in the connections with other brain areas that, that may cause this, um, um, this, behavior, this behavioral effect. Can I just round off? I just, uh, would, would you expect that uh, stimulate that exercising the mental uh, imagery ability, which is intact, would that aid perception? Do you see an avenue for, for some kind of uh, retraining or rehabilitation there? Yes. So if, if it's really um, the problem with the mental imagery that causes um, the, uh, the behavioral effects of not receiving, a, um, not being able to report about perceiving a, a face, for example, um, I, think, I think there are ways at least in, in our experience, on our limited experience that we have in mental imagery, uh, we did see uh, training effects uh, in, in mental imagery, at least in, in the experiment that we did, um, where they could improve uh, their mental imagery capability, at least based on the tasks that we run. And um, next to that, I think, um, so um, what I would say about <clears throat> um, the imagery capabilities, I think that there's, there's quite a range in which uh, imagery ability is, um, uh, is is present in the in the population, and so um, it, it will be very very interesting research question to see whether we can actually train individuals mm -hmm. to be able to become better at uh, mental imagery. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the opposition will be continued by uh, Professor Eduardo Fernandez Jofer, uh, uh, the chair in cellular biology at the Institute of Miguel Hernandez University. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to, first of all, to express my congratulations for your very impressive uh, work and, and also extend my congratulations to your, to your promoters. And uh, I have to, to say that I would like to be there with you, I mean, in, in person, but it has been completely impossible for me. So I'm very, I'm very sorry. But uh, nevertheless, I thank you also for your presentation, for your summary that has been very, uh, I really like it, very, very impressive. And uh, I have to say also that I'm very impressed by your work, by the work covered in, in your thesis and by all the results you have to, to date. And probably I only have some, I would say, some curiosities. Uh, the, the first one, 
the first question is in, in your uh, in your thesis, you state that uh, your approach can help to minimize surgical risk. But uh, I wonder, in the uh, are you taking into account, for instance, the, the blood vessels? Because it's not only enough. I uh, mean, the just the location of the pixel of the I mean the, the location of the of the electrode, but for the surgery. If you have some blood vessel in one uh, useful po position, could be a problem. Are, are you also taking this into account? Dear Halis and opponent, thank you for your compliment for your question. Yes, this is definitely something that we want to take into account in future um, uh, versions of our framework. So we've already uh, collected um, data in blind individuals um, that allows us to segment um, <clears throat> in 3D the, the vasculature. At least the larger the larger um, veins and arteries um, and the idea is that we can use this information um, to add this to our simulation so we can basically um, create a creative framework in which we have um, both the functional organization for the functional information about the brain um, <clears throat> and also we can we, we can include the, the vasculature information in there so this this might probably lead to a situation where um, algorithm finds a way or at least finds uh, the, the possible angles that we can approach the brain from to avoid uh, like larger veins in this case okay uh, another question is following your model can you provide us a uh, number of the minimum uh, the minimum amount the minimum number of electrodes for providing a useful vision i mean because uh, it's also important not the, the spatial and temporal resolution but also the coverage so how many electrodes do we need for a useful visual vision thank you for your question um, i think that's a very important question as um, in the end uh, the most important goal here is to like, to create functional phosphine vision and i think this question we can best answer using uh, simulations based on um, um, like phosphine simulating, phosphine simulator studies. So there are colleagues of mine in Nijmegen that are actually working specifically on, on these type of tasks. So where they have um, specific tasks like navigation or um, body recognition, and they use this, um, uh, they, 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 aim, they base this basically on uh, images taken by a camera, and then they uh, do simulations um, uh, on uh, taking different amounts of uh, phosphines in a simulation and they ask participants to perform these tasks and then they compare uh, different numbers of phosph uh, phosphines and i think also different types of, of, of um, um, distributions and what we what we try to add to this is to give them the uh, phosphine distributions that are actually realistic based on on the anatomy of the brain Okay, I, I, another question I have because I, I think that your approach is going to be very, very useful for the future, for the development of a cortical visual prosthesis and a, a, anyone in the world is going to use probably your, your approach. But the, uh, one question for instance we have right now is, okay, the, uh, you know, you can predict the position of the electrode, but can you also predict the, the deep of the electrode? I mean, should we stimulate it layer four, layer five to six? Is there any information from your model about this? Yes, so I, I think this really depends on uh, the level of, of quality of the, um, the functional information that we can, can, we, uh, can uh, obtain. So if you want to have more information about um, how, um, how we might um, <coughs> create a system where we can target specific uh, layers of the cortex, then we also need to, to get better information about um, um, how, how the, um, <clears throat> the functional organization is um, present in these, in these uh, different cortical layers. So I think um, we don't have currently have the, the information that we need to answer this research question, but, it's, but hopefully that's something we can work towards soon. And which is your uh, idea or your thoughts about the, the role of plasticity, pl a cortical plasticity for the future of this approach? Um, so you're asking what the role of uh, plasticity is yeah. in what, what exactly? Yeah, okay, because you are, you are using for your model, uh, you are using uh, uh, control subjects. 
but blind surgery, for instance, uh, are different. And also because of the training, uh, brain can, can change. And the, the precision, maybe even the locations can change. Do you think that this could have uh, be important in, in the future, this uh, small or minor changes or bigger changes? Yes, thank you for your question. So I think I think that's definitely something we need to consider. Um, so we see, I think we, we there are, there's evidence that um, as people are blind for a longer period of time, there is more fun, uh, functional reorganization happening in the brain. And the, the question is um, whether the brain can actually uh, learn to reverse this, this remapping. So if, if mm -hmm. you would place the electrodes based on what we know um, from functionalization in a large on a large group, for example, if you use an atlas to project this to a specific individual and try to estimate the, the functionalization in this blind individual, then of course there might might have been a remapping. So there might be a mismatch between the map that you expect and um, the map that's actually of other functional organization is actually still present in this person's brain. But I think in, in this the, state, the, the same um, and the nature of the brain can also can also be uh, working on benefit. So it might actually be able to uh, for, to have another remapping uh, that matches um, where we place the electrodes, because this person will actually use, um, hopefully, will use these phosphine, uh, phosphines to, for example, move around um, um, uh, outside, and also to be able to uh, recognize certain objects. And if there's a mismatch between what they um, um, what the camera perceives and what uh, what you're stimulating in your brain, hopefully this this also causes this kind of remapping. And, and do you think, for instance, that the, the, the data from the Speller uh, BCI you are, you are developing should be more or less the same that the prediction from the retinotopy max? So, I mean, you can, the can you, from, from your model, uh, before making the, the studies, can you know exactly which part of the brain is going to be activated when you are thinking of the experiment of imaging? Brain imaging when the person are thinking on the letters and so on. Very short uh, answer. Very short answer. So, so I didn't catch exactly the question. So your question is about mental imagery in relation to uh, yeah. our prediction of the random topic maps. Yeah. So I think this is uh, something that we try to uh, uh, show with with our, in, in chapter four that at least the spatial organization is very much preserved, and hopefully. Um, uh, <clears throat> Hopefully, the, this information can also be used to, for example, um, uh, aid in the process of, of mental imagery. Do we have time for a last question? Uh, no, I'm afraid no. not. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the opposition uh, will be continued by uh, Professor Peter de Weert, the chair in Neurosciences of Perceptual Learning and Attention at Maastricht University. Thank you, Pro-Victor. Um, dear candidate, uh, I hope you're holding up. Yes, um, um, I want to congratulate you to begin with, with this uh, extremely nice uh, thesis, um, and of course also your promoter team. Um, I, I enjoyed reading it, although I really didn't have time, but I, I read it. And um, I think it's a very nice example of extremely good uh, uh, fundamental research with a direct avenue towards an application. So this is sort of the kind of research that many of us maybe dream to do, but you were actually uh, doing it. So I think it was a it's, it's a great work and very enjoyable to read. Um, when I uh, looked at the imagery uh, chapter, so that's my, um, I have a few questions about that. Um, I had a sort of naive uh, idea on uh, how well you might be doing in uh, reconstructing these letters. In fact, um, maybe even before that, in how well um, the letters you would reconstruct from the perception would look on the brain. So I, I'm thinking big letters, four degrees in all directions mm -hmm. from fixation. You probably did that on purpose. Uh, cortical magnification, so in the brain, over the entire extent, seven, eight, nine centimeter, depending on the individual. Um, seven T, I don't know, point spread function, two millimeter, I don't know. 
and then you get all of this noise uh, in the conceptual representation what do you think um, yeah is is happening there i mean and and do you share the surprise or is this actually uh, quite normal yeah, Alice in Poland. Thank you for your nice compliments and for your interesting question. Um, so your question refers to um, why why I think is there still a lot of noise present, even though we scan uh, individuals at very high resolution and let them um, perceive um, quite large uh, stimuli. That's your question. <clears throat> and so, so with with any technique, I think that fMRI also has its limits in terms of. Um, um, spatial resolution still even though it's one of the best um, techniques that we have for this uh, purpose um, so it, i think in any measurement device there is there is noise and that is that's something that we unfortunately have to accept um, so what, what, we're trying, what we're trying to do is to uh, keep pushing the limits of, of these um, um, techniques in order to to see how far we can get so how what's, what's the um, uh, the maximum precision that we can get what's the smallest uh, stimulus that we can, we can reconstruct and um, so I think if, um, yeah, so, so of course there is, there is limitations, I, I admit that, but I think in general, it's, it's already quite remarkable that we can um, mm -hmm. um, reconstruct these images in, in this level of detail. Okay, so then of course you did something very smart. So you did this uh, autoencoder where uh, in the end that gives you a sort of um, estimate of noise that you then used in reconstructing the, the, the imagery. And then I was intrigued by figure um, 435, where you see uh, for the different participants and also for the different letters, uh, how much this autoencoder actually helps you. Um, it's on page uh, 109. Yes. And the, the thing that I found interesting is that um, there are systematic differences between people and between letters. And I'm wondering what that tells you. Yeah. Yeah. So, of course, we can only speculate about um, the reasons for these uh, differences. So, I think um, to start with um, the nature of the stimuli, I think there's already a difference. Um, if you compare, for example, the letters T and H compared to the letters S and C, there, there's a difference in morphology there. So, also comparing straight lines with cur curved lines. So, maybe it's simply easier for our model or maybe even for the brain to uh, to process these uh, types of information and um, <clears throat> so i think the uh, the part about the other quarter um, so it might be able to um, um, to improve these letters better because uh, the underlying uh, or the, at least the raw reconstruction is already better for these letter shapes mm -hmm. and another uh, alternative reason that could um, explain these differences is the, the difference in mental imagery ability. So there's a huge range in mental imagery ability, and these might also explain um, why there are differences between these individuals. Yes, I can also imagine all of these factors. There's one thing that you didn't mention, um, and that is eye movements. And I, is it, uh, maybe I missed it, but did you actually measure the eye movements in the scanner? No, for the st study, unfortunately, we did not measure eye movements. Okay. And I agree with you that this, um, would be a very nice addition to future studies, so we can know whether, uh, if if the, if they are making eye movements, that this this could also distort um, our, our ability to, uh, re yes. to reconstruct these images. Yes, yeah. because when I saw the letters, I sort of a priori uh, thought <coughs> that uh, when you have an age, um, for example, you know, you remember that I I uh, uh, I've done some neurophysiology uh, in some older days. Uh, and for example, one thing that you do when you teach a monkey to fixate is you don't give them like crosses and straight lines because you know that they're making their they're, they're making eye movements exactly along straight lines. And so uh, when you have an age, I thought immediately, okay, so there's going to be eye movements and there's going to be more eye movements than around the, the C because that's much harder to trace. So, so you're not they're not your participants are not going to continue to do this. I'm suggesting that um, they uh, might use eye movements in the perceptual phase uh, when they're uh, sort of inspecting these letters. And this also brings me to another question, and I don't know if you have data from other studies maybe about this, because the fact that the autoencoder does so well probably means, if I'm right, that eye movements are a big factor in creating the noise, that maybe they 
use the same ad movement, ad movement strategies when um, sort of uh, calling the uh, imagery into their, uh, let's say, perceptual space, let's say. Is there any evidence about it, that, that people replicate uh, eye movements that they did while inspecting the stimulus when they are asked to imagine them? Thank you for your question. I think this your comment is well taken. I think it's um, I think it's uh, very important to realize. Um, so as far as I know, um, I can't really recollect any specific study that looked at imagery and and recorded eye, eye movements. Um, but I see your point, and I think this this might be uh, something that we should definitely investigate. Okay, um, do we have time? A short question. Okay, then I'm going to read a sentence that I didn't necessarily agree with. Uh, a sentence from uh, I think it was your general <coughs> discussion. Um, it said, while providing explicit instructions to participants prohibited them from engaging in a more ecologically valid form of imagery, it is unlikely to fundamentally alter the neural process underlying imagery. So the context here is that you're trying to say that um, what you're studying with these letters generalizes to other objects. Now, letters are extremely highly overtrained and overexposed stimuli. Um, and the question is, are you really safe in this statement? Um, thank you for your question. <clears throat> I think it's I think it's also a good comment. Um, so I agree with you that uh, letter shapes are something that we uh, encounter a lot during our daily lives, and um, so in that sense, uh, it might be the, might be the case that our um, letter shape imagery might not always generalize to other shapes. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily the case. And um, I think the only way that we can find out is by actually um, including other objects. For example, um, like we could start with very simple shapes, um, like um, anything other than letter shapes to mm -hmm. see whether it actually generalizes to, uh, to other shapes as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. So the opposition will be continued by um, Dr. Judith Peters. Uh, of the Computer Science Department at our Maastricht University. Dear candidate, I also would first like to start with congratulating you on this impressive work and I also want to extend my congratulations to your promoter team. And yeah, I read your thesis with great interest. I was particularly intrigued by um, chapter three because I think it is a great step forward to make uh, such prosthesis more um, clinically uh, available. But I can imagine it was also quite a difficult project to start with, especially at the start. Um, the decision to where to place the electrodes along the visual hierarchy must have been a quite tough decision, whether you place it support V1, V2, V3, because they differ so much in terms of not only the surgical accessibility, but also their uh, properties. So you now targeted V1, uh, had some electrodes also in V2, V3. I wonder whether you, looking back at with these results in hand, whether you would reconsider to perhaps choose another area, taking every uh, like consideration into account or combination of areas. Thank you for your compliments and your question. Mm. Yeah, so this is this has been a question that's definitely been on our mind. So, um, which area would be more suitable for a visual cortical prosthesis? And uh, I think our simulations show that um, they mainly show that it's not really a problem with the region that causes um, electrodes to be placed just outside V1 in V2, for example, um, or maybe in <clears throat> just outside gray matter. Um, I think that's that's the main reason that we see that is main, mainly due to the shape of the of the electro design. So it's, it's a, quite a, a large um, and rectangular shape, which, which doesn't really uh, closely resemble the, the curvature of the brain. So in that sense, um, I think that's that's the main reason for that. Uh, in terms of why we <coughs> chose for V1 in the first place is that because it has a re relatively large surface space, so we, we can uh, place relatively large amount of electrodes. And also this allows us to have um, a bit more spacing between the electrodes which is important if you don't want the fossils to, to merge. 
And um, if you compare, for example, uh, compared to the LGN, which is quite a small nucleus in the thalamus, um, you would have you would have similar issues of not being able to put electrodes very closely together without uh, stimulating um, uh, phosphines at, uh, <clears throat> at the same time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, the opposition will be uh, continued by Dr. Ma Michael Gears, um, researcher at the Brain Innovation and Cognitive Neuroscience Department of Maastricht University. Dear candidate, dear Rick, uh, first of all, let me also congratulate you and your promoted team to this to this great work, especially in these uh, difficult times you achieved to uh, yeah, streamline uh, different types of, of research into really um, highly important questions and solutions for these for these questions. So uh, I really enjoyed reading your thesis and also since uh, as you know I'm, I'm working in the field of brain computer interfaces for a while, it's really nice to see that we're getting closer and closer to patients and to applications and targeting this from different angles. So this was really uh, interesting for me to read. Um, and since I'm also here to challenge you, I would like to um, yeah, uh, target my question more into the direction of the application of brain computer interfaces. And uh, as you know, most of the brain computer interfaces don't use the direct imagery of, uh, of a specific target or a specific uh, object that people want to communicate, but more indirect um, control of a joystick of a moving, um, of an error movement or <coughs> of a timely presented stimuli where the participant can indicate that, uh, or patient can indicate that he wants to encode this specific letter object or word. Now, when you show that in, in chapter four, that it's possible to do um, basically a BCI with just imagine the letter that gives the opportunity to, for the patient to not learn to, to use a BCI, but just imagine directly what uh, what he or she wants to encode. Now the reliability of the of the BCIs, as especially now recently showed by Professor Bierbaumer um, with the um, invasive BCI, is quite high and it works reliably in locked in patients. So my question, uh, my first question <coughs> would be, if you have these these letter shapes, uh, do you think or how would it be possible to translate this to a more general uh, brain computer interface where you can indicate more than these four first letters. Thank you for your compliments for your question. So yes, it's um, your question refers to our PCI um, or pos a possible PCI application to, uh, to our work and involves um, imagining letter shapes in order to um, in order for for example lock in patients to communicate again. And I think um, as you mentioned compared to existing paradigms um, in which they have to devise some mental strategy in order to um, convey what, what the person is trying is thinking or trying to say. Um, yes, in, in that sense, our, our approach would offer definitely a more direct way um, of, of, um, of conveying what they mean. And so in terms of uh, generalizing this to, um, uh, to communi communi communication, I think there are ways that you can um, use our approach to um, to indeed, hopefully, at some point, extend this, exper this, this experiment with uh, not only multiple letters, but also uh, other simple shapes that might be um, um, <clears throat> might require, for example, if, if you think about um, if, you, if you try to imagine an apple, uh, that that would um, indicate, for example, that a person's hungry, and in, in that sense, it's just an example of how. Um, our, our paradigm could lead to something that is more natural, more direct um, compared to the existing uh, BCI systems. So you would <coughs> even even say that letters is just the start and the imagination of the specific object could be in the future the direct communication that you really think about the object and not only a letter shape uh, in, in that. Yes, so there have also been um, um, comparable studies where they do not use these simple shapes but they actually use natural scenes. And they show that um, like decoding of natural scenes can already be very, um, they, can, they can reach quite nice um, classification accuracies. So not reconstruction, but classification accuracies based on, um, on mental imagery. Talking about <coughs> classification accuracies, um, you, you highlighted two participants in, in the chapter, participant three and five, 
um, doing very well in in the classification accuracies. Um, do you have indications of um, yeah why why these three um, or why these two participants were good and would you think that it's possible to improve the uh, the ability of the other participants to get to the same level? Because if we're talking about brain computer interfaces, we would like to be able to restore this in the majority of the people. Here you show two examples out of uh, out of six. So what do you think is, is achievable? Yeah, so I think that's a very nice question. And um, <clears throat> so there might be multiple reasons why these, um, uh, these differences um, exist, as uh, Peter already mentioned. But um, <clears throat> uh, my uh, sorry, um, but also um, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So there are uh, a lot of um, behavioral measures in which, in which you can which you can use to assess uh, mental imagery capability. You have uh, binocular rivalry, which is um, proposed by many that is that is as an objective way of measuring um, imagery capability. And then also mental rotation, and also maybe even our task can be used to, um, <clears throat> at some point, be a marker for mental imagery capability. Um, so I think it's for that to, to be able to be the case, we need to um, um, basically acquire more samples to be able to say, okay, we can link um, the performance on our task with uh, some other behavioral measure before we can say, okay, um, that our, our task is really a good measure mental imagery. <coughs> and um, so yeah, I think that's what I wanted to say. So that, that would also potentially mean in the future to basically differentiate specific brain computer interfaces to specific people and seeing which uh, would suit best for, uh, for a brain computer interface. Yes. In, in that sense. Yes. And to come back to your, the second part of your question, I think, I think it's definitely not definitely, but I think there's there's a, a really good um, possibility that you might be able to train people to become better at this mental imagery paradigm. Do we have time for another question? Um, yeah, I would like to ask uh, your parents to read uh, one of the proposition proposition number ten. If it's possible. Scientists have the responsibility to evaluate both the risk and potential gains involved with a store with brain computer interfaces. Thank you. Yes, this is basically following the, uh, the the general discussion that we are having. Um, if you if you can <coughs> be able to to restore, um, yeah, the, the the potential to communicate, what is the, in your opinion, the 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 trade off between risk and potential um, quality of the brain computer inter interface? Because you you showed nicely you can do non invasive brain computer interfacing and you get the ability to communicate maybe at some point, at least that's your vision. Then you can do invasive brain computer interfaces where you want to restore vision. So where is the, the trade-off and how would you decide for a patient to go this way or the other? Thank you for your question. That's it's a very important issue. Um, so I think, first of all, I think it's, it, it depends on the severity of the, of, of the loss of function. So if the person is completely locked in and there's no other way to communicate, and I think uh, you can go quite far in uh, trying to get this person to be to communicate again. Uh, so in that sense, um, um, like a more invasive approach would be would be suitable. And uh, for example, with uh, the patients that that, are, that have become blind at a certain point of time, we see that there is quite, at least to the people that I've talked talk to, there's quite a range in which um, they say, okay, I would like to have a prosthesis like this to be able to see again. And other people, other other persons are completely fine with the way they are. So I think it's uh, very important to take into account um, the, the wishes of the patients. And next to that, I think it's also important um, as, a, as for, them, for, the for the clinician to, um, to make this, um, this trade-off between, okay, uh, what's the risk of, for example, brain surgery and how does, it, um, how does it compare to the possible gains that this person might get with, uh, for example, a cortical visual implant. And do, do you think that's the responsibility of the scientist or of the clinician to evaluate that? I think it's, um, I think it's a combined effort. So I think the scientist can, um, um, can, give you, can give a clinician an idea of um, what, what could possibly be regained using a, a certain device and um, what, what um, the, the possible um, 
functions that, that a telescope device can uh, can yield. And the clinician can, can tell the, the scientists, okay, this, these are the, um, the, the clinical dangers that are involved. Yeah. And so from the scientific point of view, since you're a researcher, um, you, you also want to be ensured that the decision or the, the proposition that you give to the patient that you are safe to say, okay, this the risk and the, the benefit is basically valid. So I, I think it makes a lot of sense to not only rely this on a researcher, but really to to share this with um, other experts to be on, on the safe side, because that is the, the, the main uh, <coughs> challenge where we are talking about individuals and we, we try to solve a bigger problem, but we still talk to uh, yeah, have, have individual problems. So I think that's, that's really great to combine. Yeah, efforts. I think it's a good point. And I think for the, um, for the, uh, the blind individuals, there are also these um, institutions that are working with these blind people and they also talk a lot to these blind people and those are then connected to clinicians and researchers. And I think this is the way to go to uh, to really have like this integration of knowledge of the people that are very close to the patient and people that are a bit further away, like like us as scientists and, uh, and clinicians sometimes as well. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a little bit of time left. So uh, Professor Fernando Scofer, if uh, if you would like, you could uh, continue the opposition with your remaining questions. Okay, thank you very much. So but my, my last question was a very general question. So you have several papers and you have uh, several studies. And my question is, if you have to choose only one result from the, the main conclusion of your work, the main conclusion, a single conclusion of your work, which is the what you choose? Thank you for your question. <laughs> um, that's a very difficult question. I know. <laughs> um, I think all three projects are very interesting, and um, I don't know. It's 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 a tricky question. <laughs> if I have to choose one, then um, I'll probably choose chapter three or chapter four. As um, so, so, I think in chapter three, the reason to choose that chapter would be that it's uh, very close to to. A, or closer to a clinical application than chapter four. So in that sense, I find that this work very interesting. On the other, on the other hand, I find the um, um, techniques behind chapter four also very interesting. So I think I, I owe you uh, an answer to this question. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so the, the opposition can still be continued by uh, Professor Peter de Beer. Okay, um, let's um, let's do an um, um, an imaginary experiment, and suppose that you had the information to decide in which layers to place the electrodes, and let's say that you also had the information <laughs> to decide whether you would place in V one in the blobs or the interblobs. Where would you place your electrodes? To where would you place your your electrodes? That's a very interesting question. Um, I think I think this requires a bit more thought. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also happy to take this answer um, at the reception later yes. on. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. So, Enriquez, Johannes, Rick van Hove, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations at our return in this room.
Enriquez Johannes Rick van Hoof, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Goebel is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with the Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisors to now take the floor. First a question, Rick. Belooft u dat u altijd volgens de beginselen van wetenschappelijke integriteit de werk zult gaan. Eerlijk en zorgvuldig, transparant, onafhankelijk en verantwoordelijk. Dat beloof ik. Trachtens de bevoegdheid ons door de wet toegekend, volgens het besluit van de commissie hier tegenwoordig, verklaar ik hier bij u, Enricus Johannes Rick van Ho, tot dokter te bevorderen en u alle rechten te verlenen die daaraan volgens wet en gewoonte zijn verbonden. Ten bewijze hiervan overhand ik, ik u nu de bul door rector, secretaris, in overige leden van de promotiecommissie ondertekend en met het grootzegel van de universiteit bevestigd. Dr. Van Hoof, this sounds cool. Congratulations for your wonderful performance today, for the wonderful thesis. All three chapters of your thesis, I would say, are very close to my heart. So thanks so much for your really valuable contributions to that interesting and important work. And I want to also um, um, extend my congratulations uh, to your family here and your partner, Stacy. And I really think you can be as proud as I am today about Rick. Great achievement. Um, and um, honestly, saying that um, these are very important pieces, I fully understood when you reacted, as Eduardo said later, a bit like a politician, to not be able to decide, you know, between <laughs> what is your favorite or what would you choose, right? But it was a good answer. I would have given exactly the same. Um, yeah, I want to also thank the Corona members uh, for joining mostly in person, but especially Eduardo for joining virtually. I know you couldn't come, you know this very well, but it's so great that you were here today and contributed. Yeah, and you know what's usually happening in that? I will be brief because Mario and I, we share the Laudatio for you. So I will be brief, but I wanted to look a little bit back. I was not interviewing you like Milena and Peter, but I, of course, uh, had a, uh, an eye on you early on in the research master. But you actually, uh, uh, which I also learned a bit later, that you had made two bachelors already. One was actually in, in Eindhoven in computer science and engineering, very cool. Um, and um, then you did here, not the standard psychology, but health sciences, as far as I remember. And then you entered via these interviews, our um, cognitive neuroscience master. And um, we really got in contact closer when you wanted to do an internship. 
and that was your local supervisor of your very nice internship on neurofeedback at the frontal eye field, which you did at Oxford University. So, so and I thought, hmm, this guy is really smart, has a super background. And when you then came back and asked what opportunities there are for a PhD, of course, I wanted to immediately offer you a position, as you know. Um, I was very transparent with my thought, you should get one immediately, but I didn't have a position. So then I said, you know, we just get a vacant position in, in brain innovation because Mona went to Stanford at that time. And you basically um, uh, became part of brain innovation for almost two years, right? As far as I remember. So it was a bit longer than originally planned, but it was a fantastic time because you worked on the Atlas that was, is now one of your chapters at that time together with Mona uh, leaving at some point to Stanford. Um, and uh, also of course with Mario and he probably will say more about this to you, um, uh, this phase. But I think the important point was that then um, the grant came through and it was the Nestor grant which I offered you to work in this grant, which now has become one of the two favorite chapters of your thesis, as we know, thanks to the question of Eduardo. So, so it was then great that you could start in that. And like in the in, in brain innovation, um, you, you immediately were a good team player. You, you, you are so capable. You have, have coding skills. You are a team player. So everyone wants to have you to so help, help to solve problems, which is a good and a bad thing. Because to be honest, when I really reflected, when I traveled yesterday from Hamburg to here to be here in person, because I'm often at the moment not, not really here, I, I reflected on this and I thought, actually, this guy could have written at least two theses. You know, if you look what you have done outside what you presented today, it's, it's really amazing. For example, the full work with this Gail Russ, which is an amazing study on, on learning based on FMI activity to, to select stimuli. And also a lot of what you did in Nestor, doing a lot of work, which a little bit you alluded to indirectly today. For example, the imagery in the blind work to also help to correct the, the positioning maybe of the electrodes in the future and many other things. So I had really a long list I don't want to go through. Uh, but but this was really um, um, amazing what you have done, even on top of what you have presented here today. And I hope that some of this, we can actually complete some of this work together, because fortunately you can stay with us a bit longer and we are happy to have you a bit longer. I'm not sure what happens in the fall next year, but at least until then, I'm looking very much forward um, to our collaboration. But of course, you also are um, a person which, um, you know, um, um, yeah, um, you're stylish. Uh, you always appear very stylish, at least in my eyes. <laughs> Especially your hair, I always challenges. Honestly, and, and and I never told you. I was in Hamburg at a at a, at a hair cutter too, a little bit match, but I, of course it's not possible. <laughs> so, so just just to mention that, yeah. And and I also know, of course, that um, um, uh, you build a house or let build a house, it's, uh, you know. But you have your own house. That's that's great. And you did this all next to all this work for your PhD. It's wonderful. And actually, um, um, uh, yeah, I'm also jealous about this dog you have. This is unbelievable. You know, he looks so cute. This um, uh, James is the name, James, right? Yeah. And, 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 it, and it has these two different colored eyes. It's an Australian Shepherd. And, and when I showed it my wife, Claudia, from, from which I should also give you her contract, we see later, actually. And, and she also couldn't believe how nice that dog is. And she envies you for that dog, <laughs> just to tell you that. <laughs> Yeah, I think I will not go too much further because I want to also give from the few minutes we have Mario a chance to address you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Rainer. Thank you, Rainer. One moment. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Van Hof, dear Rick. Uh, yes, first of all, I would also like to congratulate you on this fantastic work that you have done in your thesis and here, what you have presented and the way you answered the questions. It was really fantastic. And I would like to uh, extend my congratulations also not just to you, but of course also to your family. It's really fantastic work. But I know you've been doing fantastic work because I've been seeing you doing fantastic work throughout this time. And usually at this point, people kind of tell a little bit the, the developments, you know, as you start. Uh, with your trajectory from a student to a scientist, but the very first time I met you, you were already a scientist. I mean, you were so diligent, organized. I think you're still the only person I know who knows how to use Microsoft Access, but <laughs> it's uh, it was really amazing. And, but reflecting on it, I thought, okay, that's a bit difficult now. I cannot tell and relate the story of, of this development. But that doesn't mean there was no development. What I have really seen is actually you taking on 
the expert role in the group when it comes to fMRI, really from the data acquisition side, but also from the data analysis side. And we have very quickly realized that basically the entire group very quickly started to come to you as their person, right, who, who can help and, and make things work. So that's really fantastic. So I think it's not just me, it's the entire group that is very proud of you today and very happy with the work that you're doing. It's, it's really fantastic. And that's also why I was a little bit shocked at some point I didn't tell you, but when you told me that you were thinking about maybe leaving after your PhD, I was very, very sad. And I tried not to let to let on, but I was really hoping that you would stay in the group, and you did, and that's really fantastic. So, Rick, yeah, design thoughts of you. Thank you. Dear Dr. Van Hoff, also on behalf of the Board of Deans and on behalf of the Faculty of Psychology and Neuroscience, I congratulate you with this honor you have acquired. And of course, I also would like to extend these congratulations to your supervisory team and uh, to your family, parents, your partner Stacy, and all uh, friends and colleagues around. And um, I would like to ask uh, every, like the, the audience to um already go to the uh, outside to the reception there will be a reception in the garden and uh, while we will we'll take some pictures here still also together with the online uh, opponent thank you oh, yeah 